First of all, I want to echo um, the sentiments that, uh, I'm not sure which mic I'm using here, um, about this, the uniqueness of this gathering and this um, impetus of the Festival of Faith. I just, I, I really can't say just how courageous I, see, I think that this gathering is and that each of you who have shown up here is and, and us being courageous together. So I'm just going to ask for a little round of applause that way. Uh, because in theory, we're not supposed to talk about religion and politics and um, science, apparently, too, uh, all together. So, and yet, here we are. We're doing it. Um, so, uh, I'm going to start out with a different kind of song, and it's not the kind of song I sing well, but I still want to sing it. We are here to give all, all our love to the ones unborn. We are here to give all, all our love to the ones unborn. That's a song by my daughter and a good uh, daughter, Lila June, um, and a good friend of hers, Desiree Harp, who is a classically trained Native American woman opera singer. Um, and that uh, song is called Time Traveler, if you want to look it up on YouTube. Amazing song. But I've been thinking about it all day. So I want to uh, talk first, uh, what I didn't get to say over here, that's what I was trying to pull for, is, is my, my clan grandfather also said that in our culture we don't pathologize. And he was really talking about mental illness, um, depression, um, et cetera. And, uh, and so what does that mean? That means that we, that we found ways to incorporate whoever showed up among us and assumed that they were a gift to us and we made a place for them. We didn't just make a place for them, but we, but we were always um, building our community around the idea that what is it that they are here to bring to us, for us. So it wasn't a matter of trying to fix it, always. So I wanna, I wanna place that in our, in, our, in our big basket that we got going here. I also want to talk about um, you know, I, I was going through a, a very difficult time and I was using all the tricks, the bag of tricks, spiritual and otherwise that I knew to kind of get myself out of that place. And um, I ended up calling my cousin and my cousin ended up saying to me, if you're not waking up every day feeling grateful and joyful to be on this mother earth, you need to go see a medicine man. So I won't ask for a show of hands of who might need a medicine man here, but um, <laughs> but that 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 changed a lot for me. She's a very traditional woman, and that she was telling me, "This is your baseline. This is your baseline." Wow, wow, what a baseline, huh? It's not a baseline that we really think about too much in modern world, but it, but it really changed my whole orientation um, to say that that that's where that's where I could be at any given moment. And so I think a lot of our spiritual practices talk about how to, um, how to, how to bring us back to that place over and over again. And so in, in my people, I, I feel like we, we come from a place of original beauty, or we might say original harmony, original vitality, or maybe even original joy. And so that's our, that's our, that's our, our home. And sometimes we depart from there, and sometimes we depart from there so far that we, that we need our whole community to come back together in a formal way, in what we call ceremony, and to sing the truth back into us. The truth of the beauty of who we are, where we are, and how it is. And that's how we heal. So along those lines, um, I think I spoke a little bit about this last year. I, I, I uh, well, I, I was called upon to do some healing work on a very large human issue. It was actually a point in our history. Um, 
and, and, and this is how that healing work was described to me. And this came from a spirit guide, a very, very ancient elder woman looking spirit guide. And um, she came to me and she said, look, all healing is is the truth. And that means all disease is is a lie. Some part of you is believing a lie, body, mind, heart, or spirit. So she says, what the healer does is tries to live their life in such a way that they hold and maintain like that fire of truth inside of themselves by the way they live, by the way they conduct themselves, by the way they, they maintain themselves. And she said, so the healer comes to the person with the disease and presents the truth to them in a way that the person with the disease can understand clearly. So clearly that that person then is able to repeat that truth to themselves in such a way that they no longer need the healer to be there. And when this happens, that vibration of the lie begins to vibrate at the vibration of truth. And when that happens, we call that healing. Well, no one has ever explained healing to me that way before. But it's something that I have been bringing deeper and deeper and deeper into my own personal life, my own personal healing. Um, I, I've been, I've been uh, kind of making myself say this, but as a person who has descended from the attempted genocide attempt on this continent, uh, I, I wanna say that to, to stand here and I'm not saying this for me so much as for any other indigenous person that you might meet. Um, I wanna say it's not easy to come and stand right here. And, and I feel like it's, it's, it's time to acknowledge that. Um, there, it takes a lot of work to overcome trauma, depression, um, a number of different things to be able to stand and participate as a global citizen. And so I just wanna bring that awareness to us. And, that, and that's also true for me. Um, I've just passed through a time of being sort of uh, uh, having a whole trauma abyss opened up again that I never thought I would revisit again. So this topic today is very relevant to me. Um, and, and so I'm gonna also say that I, I really feel at this point that we are a traumatized species and it's multi-generational. So I can talk about what, those, what that trauma was for me as an indigenous person on the, uh, descendant from this continent. But, but I'm gonna say, no matter where you go and whether you've been perpetrated against or, or, or come from a lineage of perpetration, there's trauma there, right? And so this, this methodology, methodology about healing and being the truth has a lot to do with being able to speak the truth about what's taking place for each of us wherever we find ourselves on that trauma spectrum and whatever it is that has caused it. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump here a little bit. Um, so you know, in in scientific, I remember you know just in undergraduate basic psychology 101, um, you know they they talked to us about these these poor monkeys. Gosh, these poor monkeys, um, who were you know they they seat them together, and the one has the control, and um, if the one messes up, they both get shocked. You know, maybe you've heard of that. So, experiment and um, and the one who doesn't have the controller is like 10 times more stressed out than the one who does have the controller right never forgotten that one and so here's what I want to say about that in terms of our world so part of the way that I deal with my PTSD which I do have um, is I zoom out and that's a really fantastic tool. That's actually why I get called to speak all over the world because everybody wants to know what I see from out here. Um, I have to watch out for it for my own personal health and healing because it doesn't always serve me to zoom away from what's taking place with me personally and go to us. But um, this is one of those zoom out moments, just to give you a heads up. And so, you know, I wanna, I wanna talk about consent. Because what's happening with that monkey who's strapped to the other one is they don't feel like they have any consent in the deal. And I'm gonna say that, con that and, and, we, and we see that as a very profound stressor. And so this all came up for me um, during the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, and in, you know, and, and, and watching that, 
uh, unfold, what occurred to me was this. I said, you know, really, do, does any woman ever really give consent? You know, can she ever really give consent in this world? Because if, if her um, economics are, are controlled based on her gender, she can never make the same amount of money. Um, if her health care is governed because of her gender, if her, if her reproductive processes are governed because of her gender, even if her aging process is judged and, and, and it affects her ability to have food, clothing, and shelter, um, you know, how does she ever actually give true consent? Because isn't at some level, isn't there somewhere in the background, isn't there something saying, um, gosh, I better play ball, or I might not get what I need? And so this was really striking me. And then I, and then I realized, oh, well, it's actually not just women. It's people of color as well. Do they ever really give consent in this system? And then I started thinking, okay, well, what about, what about people who don't identify in a binary gender setup? Anyway, the list began to grow, 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 grow. And I was thinking, well, who's really getting to have consent around here? And my conclusion ultimately was, at this point, we kind of have a, uh, a runaway train that we're not really running anymore <laughs> in many ways. And, and so very, 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 very few, if any, humans at this point, I think, really have a lot of consent in our setup. And I, and I think that's a huge factor for many, many issues that we're facing, including disease of all kinds, and definitely depression, and definitely suicide. So what I'm, what I'm really thinking about here with the consent is that, you know, so there is a, uh, so to relate it back to, to me culturally, which is part of my role here, um, you know, there's this, there's this notion of sovereignty. The sovereignty of all beings. Every, so I remember yesterday I talked, for those of you who are here, talked about that sacred hoop of life, and every single member of life gets to have a place on that hoop. Um, and we're gonna say that they all need to have the sovereignty to enact their perfect design for thriving life in order for the whole interbeing to function well. So, and again, I also say that, you know, yesterday I said that, that all of the other life forms are my elder because I was the last to arrive. And so they all, they all have the scoop on how to be here. And, and so as an elder, you know, I, I, I can't just move them around. I can't just do whatever I want to them. And so this sovereignty piece is actually really huge. And there's a whole other talk that I give about, about medicine, magic, and science in relation to sovereignty. And in a nutshell, it's saying that what needs to be examined in all of those things, medicine meaning uh, like shamanism, I guess you might say, is that the sovereignty piece, the law of sovereignty has not been honored in any of those arenas. And that we as a species, this is spiritual directive, need to examine that, right? So, so in terms of consent, you know, there's also, along with this sovereignty, sort of maybe a flip side or another facet of it, is the law of free will. So in this construct here on Mother Earth, um, and my understanding, um, is, 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 is made up of this law of free will. And so what that says is, is, that, is that I am supposed to give consent for all that happens to me. And so I've been thinking about this also, and what I realize is, is that we don't really even think about our consent anymore, even though it is such a powerful spiritual gift that has been given to each one of us. Huge, huge gift. So anytime one person's free will overtakes another person's free will, um, there's an accounting that has to be made up. So bear with me for one second here. I'm gonna go into this place of just saying as quickly as I can, um, that when I was born, did I give my consent to be registered with the state of New Mexico? When I was born, did I give my consent to being given a number by which I could become, uh, for the rest of my life, collateral for the US Treasury? 
by paying taxes every year for the rest of my life? Did I give consent to being vaccinated? Did I give my consent to um, being placed in, in a school system that trained me only to use my intellect? Did I, you know, so you're getting the idea, right? Where all did all this consent come from? So we have this almost mechanized system of, of hurting human beings through these things that we say, this is what you will do. To the point of where we don't even recognize that nobody ever asked us for our consent. And so what, why this is important is if it's spiritual law, I'm gonna propose that a part of what can, you know, and this is why I think I'm, I'm really happy for the young people about the, the, Friday, the Friday climate protests that they have. I mean, what must it be like to be a young person being bombarded with all these statistics about, I mean, I was a little worried for them yesterday when we first started out, because <laughs> they were all sitting here listening to all these statistics about the doom and gloom of the planet. Um, and, and, and what must it feel like to not feel like you can do anything? Well, at least these Friday protests are giving them some sense of, I get to have a voice. I get to say what I think about this. I get to say, I do not consent. And I think that that's gonna have a huge impact on mental health, depression, and suicide for them. And boy, do we need an answer for that. Our young people don't wanna be here too much. So, so what I'm gonna say is this, is that what would happen if all of us together, and this is something anybody can do anywhere, you can do it while you're washing the dishes, said, I do not consent to this Mother Earth being taken from me. I do not consent to this life being taken from us. Now, where our, our you know, the noodle, uh, where that one goes is immediately to say, well, I can stand here at this podium and say that, or I could be saying it while I'm washing my dishes, but those guys, wherever those guys are, they're gonna do it anyway, so what difference does it make? Well, I'm going to say that what happens when we make a statement such as, I do not consent to something, what happens is we engage spiritual law, and by engaging spiritual law, we also bring about spiritual consequence. So this is my new endeavor right now, is to say, for my own mental health in this time, in this tumultuous time, is to say, you know, I, so now I'm gonna speak it in the positive. I try to remember to say this to myself a couple times a day. I don't know exactly what it means all the time. I don't have to know. I know it's heading in the right direction. And so what I say to myself is this, is I say, I consent only to the authority of the law of the heart of Mother Earth. I consent. I consent only to the authority of the law of the heart of Mother Earth. Because she is the authority on life in this place. She's the one who's gonna tell us how to be here. And so I wanted to bring this consent piece in as a way of saying there is a way for us to not be held to the consequences of others' decisions, at least to start with on a spiritual level to say, I am going to reclaim my consent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Responses. So I think that was beautiful. Um, I think in Canada we have Truth and Reconciliation Commission and then the task of that commission was to first of all accept the truth and that's the only way we will be able to reconcile our differences and agree. And I think, you know, you spoke so eloquently about the intergenerational oppression. Experiments were done on these uh, rats where they were exposed to cherry blossom and then shocked. For the rest of its life, that rat, whenever it smelled cherry blossom, it actually froze. And it will have post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, it will pee, it will really have all the signs of extreme anxiety. You took the babies, they have never been shocked or exposed to cherry blossom, they freeze the first time they smell cherry blossom. 
mm. and their babies do the same thing, right? Mm. Even if you artificially inseminate them, they will still feel the thing. So I think this intergenerational um, aspect permanently imprint on your neuronal network. And these networks then adapt those epigenetic changes that are then conveyed to, to intergeneration. So I think it's easier for people to say that get over it, right? So and get on with it. Well, what we need to be able to understand is that we have to make an honest and a concerted effort to reconcile, accept the responsibilities, and this is the only way when we can actually come together. Our indigenous people, the land that we stand on and we actually live on, it originally belonged to them. And I think we owe it to them enormous values that we have learned that we actually lost those values. So I really appreciate your comments. And, uh, and I think this is the truth and reconciliation is the most critical step and the, really the backbone that would allow us to reach out to. And I think accepting that as a society, what is that we have done is actually not fair. And I think the same I look at in my own Muslim community and often go in and tell them that, you know, you are constantly subjected, subjecting this younger generation um, time and again and constantly to his Islamophobia. And I think, you know, what will happen to this generation after generation when they actually come and become a citizen of this country um, and they are the societal. So I think on one hand, I try to tell them the language of victimization is the biggest victimizer. You have the power to choose, but make sure you don't fall into this trap of really going down a constant uh, oppression or believing that the world doesn't want you or like you. Thank you. Well, I'm, as a doctor, I'm sitting between like two almost radical and very <laughs> thought-provoking uh, concepts of how one might conduct oneself in medical practice. And I'm hearing about uh, <laughs> finding the truth and healing. And I, I don't quite use the word healing as a physician because I'm not sure we ever heal as physicians. We try to help reduce symptoms or help people achieve greater senses of well-being or something like that. But that was very thought-provoking to me to think about if, if I, as a physician, if I am somehow finding this sense of truth in the way I communicate with the people that come into my practice. And I think that's something that we need to strive for. Uh, in, the, in the area of consent, uh, you know, I do a lot of research and have people sign informed consents. And I'm starting to wonder if I'm really getting informed consent. Hmm. And I, I was interested in your thoughts on that because we explain all the risks and benefits and then they participate. But if they're depressed and they're really seeking help, are they able to give the kind of consent that you're talking about? I don't know, we, we worry about that. Like with patients with schizophrenia that may have uh, disordered uh, judgment or something, then that's a real big problem. With depression, we're assuming people have the ability to be told about the risks and, and benefits and then to sign a consent for it. But I'd, I'd be interested in, in maybe pursuing that a little bit further. I don't know if that's of interest to the, to the larger audience, mm -hmm. but it, it, it does raise some concerns for me as a physician. Yeah. Thank you. I wonder if, um, obviously, we're in a we're in a, a sort of extended um, national moment where there's a, a heavy focus on the concept of consent, um, coinciding with the epidemic of loneliness that we're talking about right now. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the connections there, the implications there, and whether you think um, an extended focus on consent in um, news media and in our entertainment. Um, in this country uh, is a net benefit to connectedness and bringing people closer together? Um, well, I guess when you talk about it being a national concern, I think in that case we're talking mostly about um, sec sexual relations um, consent. Uh, and, and I think that's a really great model for us to consider all the other kinds of consent that are, on, that, that are really in front of us. Um, and, and so just like you're saying, you know, what, what really constitutes consent um, if that person is impaired in some way? You know, and that comes up, that comes up in, in, in terms of sexual consent. Uh, you know, if the person is inebriated, is that really consent? Is, if the person, um, anyway, 
it, it, I think that's, I really do think that that's a great place to start, as uncomfortable as it's been for our country and really around the world to really realize how prevalent that, that issue is. But it, it, it really does um, help us to be able to think about um, what, what am I consenting to? What, how do I, how do I, how do I give my consent? And, and one, one other area that I feel like this um, follows is, you know, we, we give our consent to, to the law, um, ideally, right? And ideally the laws are there um, for our benefit. And one of the things that's, so for instance, in my, in my town, um, there's a big uh, water issue going on. They, they want to do a lot of deep aquifer drilling. Um, and we think that that's a, a great risk to the entire watershed. Um, and so what I see in that instance is that, you know, everybody, the, it's in law, so law is going to support this. But I, but I see, you know, our actual future of our life is at stake. And, and then that's going to come up over and over and over again. So at that point, you know, there's a big question right now. Do we, do we give consent to the law? And um, it's making things quite complicated. But the way, I, what I envision for my community is that everybody, like, puts the lawyer down and backs away from the table for just a moment and can we just agree to, to give, to give um, consent uh, to, to, re to reimagine and rethink things, you know, because as one thing I've been saying as kind of a radical piece is, you know, if every single law that exists, every single legal contract that exists in the world right now is fulfilled, I think we're going to lose this life. And so at that point, what do we do? And so I think, you know, on the one hand, that's alarming, but on the other hand, think of the possibilities for recreating and reimagining. And I think this is also a place of treating depression is, you know, if we're locked down to this train track, that's, that's a feeling of deep helplessness. But if we can find ways that, well, maybe we can get off of this track and find other ways of negotiation, we're going to have to find other ways of negotiation in order to be able to really respond to our situation in a clear way. Thank you so much. Thank you.